Hi. Uh, recently a friend asked me to help him with some of his car problems. And I think these are something that the internet generally should know about because this has very serious car problems and it could render a dangerous situation. So I would like to show you how to solve these car problems. And the car I'm talking about is a car CW45. Okay, so what is the problem? Um, the car CW45, as with pretty much everything else car makes, has um, a double action only hammer fired trigger mechanism, or sorry, striker fired trigger mechanism. It's very simple and most people would consider the trigger to be similar to a revolver, and I believe that was the philosophy driving it. Um, they're notably very long, very smooth, um, and require a full trigger cycle all the way on, or all the way pulled, all the way released in order to reset. There is no second strike capability as with most other striker fire. So what's the problem? Well if you look at this particular one, you can see I'm going to try to pull this as gradually as possible and you watch where it breaks. it breaks all the way back. There is no over travel. Now that's a statement a lot of people make frequently that their gun has no over travel and what they generally mean is there is very little over travel. There's a 32nd, there's a 16th of an inch of over travel. Um, in this case there is no over travel. I believe that's particular to this specific example of the CW45 and that the model line generally has a small amount of over travel. Uh, I believe this is probably a, mount, a, a effect of casting variance, which we'll get to later. Um, why is this a problem? Well, aside from the fact that it doesn't allow you any follow-through, um, it actually renders this particular one inoperable at hard-to-determine times. So right now, I'll cycle that again, you'll notice it pulls. and. I'm actually feeling the trigger contacting the frame as the trigger breaks, which makes it difficult, so I'm almost jerking the trigger. It's very difficult to shoot this one smoothly. This particular gun, according to the, my friend, the owner, has only had two or three hundred rounds other than the forty or fifty that I've put through it since I've been tinkering with it. Now, I haven't modified anything yet, and I have a couple of thoughts about where to modify it. This gun may still be under warranty, so that might be the option. I'll have to talk to him about that. But I'll show you what I think ought to be done. And I'm going to switch the camera angle and try to give you a better close-up. So again, I'm going to try to do this as gradually and slowly as possible, and I will probably do this with a grid behind it so you can see contacting the frame, more pressure, there break. Like I was actually fighting the frame where the, um, what I will later call the trigger spur contacts with the frame. And uh, in the future I will pause this camera and um, look at the exploded parts diagram and refer to the part by its part number just to address any confusion that anybody may have. I'm not a licensed gunsmith, but there's not a lot going on here. This is a deliberately simple device. If you're a competent person, you ought to be able to understand what I'm talking about. Okay? So again, do this one more time up here. I'm going to pull it as gradually as I possibly can, and I'm going to tell you when I can feel it touching the frame. I didn't actually feel it touching the frame that time. It's possible because I have a side load on the trigger there. It made a difference. But it touched the frame just as it was breaking, whereas previously I was feeling it touch the frame just slightly before. I, initially when I encountered this, I thought maybe there was some debris in between whichever trigger mechanism was con er, limits the over-travel and uh, that simply cleaning it would solve the issue. Um, on further examination, that's not actually the case. So I'm going to pause it now. All right. So the next part I'm going to show you is the actual mechanism. This in uh, is car part number 009 CW45. 
otherwise known as the Trigger. Fortunately, it lists on Carr's site as $15.40. That's good news, because I want to modify this part. The other option would be to modify the frame itself where the trigger interacts with it, which is understandably a more expensive part that has goofy FFL transfer issues. So, you know, if in doubt and you want to modify part, modify the one that's easiest to replace first. So, here is the part that's a problem, and hopefully I can get a good image of this drawing, but I will try to show it in the part, and I know this isn't going to photograph well, which is why I drew an oversize. So what I'm looking at here is the little spur on the top of the trigger just in front of where it interfaces with the uh, trigger bar, which is part number 0013 CW45. And as you pull the trigger all the way back right at the break point, a little spur on the top of the trigger intersects the frame you probably can't see it, but just in front of the trigger, there is a bar of plastic that the trigger spring interfaces against, and that provides the stop point that limits your over-travel. Um, I've checked along the full travel of the sear slash um, firing pin interrupt cam thing. I don't know what the part number is for that, and also the, tr the trigger bar and there doesn't seem to be any other limiting point so it is just this that maintains over travel I think that's actually a poor design because small imperfections are magnified on a rotating lever as opposed to a linear stop they could have put a stop in the tr or in the trigger bar that would have been a lot easier to control and have less um, multiplication of tolerance problems anyway so um, oh, I actually didn't get into the big part. So, um, first of all, I'll show you how it actually works. So hopefully you can see this picture here. And if you look right here where it's red, that is the little spur on the front of the trigger. And this blue line here is the block where it, um, the block of plastic in the frame that the trigger bottoms out against as it's pulled back. This would be the trigger bar, and this is the sear cam assembly thing. Um, nothing in there actually limits the travel. It's all limited right here. When the trigger is all the way back, this part bumps the frame. So you have metal against squishy plastic in a small location. There's a recipe for precision and consistency. I hope you can note my sarcasm there. Um, anyway... Normally, I would expect there to be a little bit of place so that at the point the trigger breaks, you can pull it just a bit further, say a 32nd of an inch. Um, that would be a nice target trigger, for instance, this 22 here. If you watch it break, it moves somewhere between a 32nd and a 64th. I haven't measured it in a while, but that's a very crisp, very nice target trigger. And yes, I'm dry firing a 22, and I know better. But watch that. Even with a target pistol not intended for self-defense, they allow a little bit of over-travel for follow-through and reliability. Let's look at another trigger that is revolver-like. There, and I'm going to drop the hammer on that so you can see it in double action mode. This is a very nice revolver-style trigger in a lot of ways. Um, A little bit of pressure, break, and a little bit of follow through. I would say that's about a sixteenth of an inch, maybe a little more. That's a very crisp, nice trigger, and this is a really good trigger. So, having a little bit of over travel is not antithetical to a good trigger and is necessary for reliability. And as I stated before, this trigger has zero over travel. Here's the big deal this trigger has zero over travel when the gun is warm. However, if you get down to freezing temperatures as it was when we were out at the range and as it was later, something in the frame flexes or shrinks and leaves you not enough over travel. So you are actually compressing the frame at this point before the trigger breaks. And um, in the case of my range uh, session 
the other day by myself, after I had seemingly cleared whatever debris might have caused this problem, I had the gun tucked into it inside the waistband holster on the way out to the range, and I ran about one magazine through it, and it was fine. And as I went in very cold degree weather, around 10 degrees yesterday, it got progressively colder, the gun did, as it matched the ambient air temperature. And the longer I shot, the worse the trigger got, to where I was straining with all my might, and uh, actually beginning to shake and unable to squeeze the trigger unless I used two hands like this. And that was the only way I could make it fire. <laughs> it was pretty ridiculous. And so I actually quit working on the load I was developing and brought it home, allowed it to assume room temperature, made sure the gun was empty, and it was working normally. And to verify, I then chucked that same empty gun that was working fine in the freezer for about 40 minutes and pulled it out and it was again a two-hand pull so that confirms it's not some debris appearing and disappearing or some other interaction it is actually cold this is a gun that that barely works in warm weather and doesn't work at all in cold weather and in intermediate it works with difficulty such that you were using straining force to pull the trigger is very smooth up until the point where it matters. <laughs> um, terrible design. So I realize this video is getting kind of long, but um, so the next question is, what is the solution? Well, the solution is obvious. This trigger needs more travel. Now, my friend said this gun has only had two or three hundred rounds through it, so it may be under warranty. Um, personally, I would be less concerned about warranty since I can modify very slightly a $15 part, $15.40, and not have the gun go away for several months. Um, this is not modifying it to make it less safe, it's actually making it modified to be more safe. Um, I realize a lot of people would have liability concerns about modifying a trigger. This is the opposite direction of liability, not a legal conclusion, just my personal thoughts on the arguments that could be made that you're rendering a gun less safe. Giving a gun more over travel is not reducing safety margins, it's actually increasing them. Um, and increasing function margins. Usually when people are cutting corners of safety, they're making triggers too fine, too light, too close, with no extra room. And this is the opposite. It's a target trigger that fights you at the target on a carry gun and uh, so anyway there's two places that you could remove I'm gonna go back to the drawing here which I'm really hoping picks up on this camera so you've got the plastic where the trigger bottoms out and then you've got the little spur on the trigger because this is um, camming it's essentially a lever very very small changes in this area will make comparatively large changes at the other end of the lever down where your finger is. So removing, say, a thousandth of material might translate to a sixty-fourth of movement of increased movement down here. What that means is a very small amount of grit can block your trigger interaction. Another reason I don't care for this particular design right there is um, it's very vulnerable to this kind of problem. Um, so, you could either hog out just a very small amount of plastic, like a thousandth or two, right there, or you could take a thousandth off the front of the trigger spur. Um, maybe two swipes of the trigger spur against a piece of sandpaper might be sufficient to solve this problem. Or uh, a knife sharpening stone or a very fine file. Um, and this would just be a guess and check until you've got I would say you would want a minimum of a 30 second of over travel. A 16th wouldn't be terrible. Um, the design doesn't allow for too much more. Looks like to me you could potentially have this trigger over travel as much as an eighth. I wouldn't want that anyway. I like minimal over travel as we've previously uh, discussed. But you want reliability. So, we've got a car that doesn't start in cold weather. This is a problem that was solved in the 70s. 
Good job. Uh, apparently it doesn't get cold in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, but perhaps before you send a gun that people's lives may depend on out into the market, you should determine that it works in both hot and cold weather. And even with a little bit of grit and debris in there. Otherwise, this is a pretty competently made, comfortable to carry, solid performing little gun. I hate the trigger style, but I understand that other people could like it. <coughs> there we go. So, um, if you have thoughts or comments, please reply it below. And I hope this helps somebody else out who's experiencing similar problems. And I hope it gets back to car and they realize what a dangerous and dumb thing they've done. Shame on you, car.